welcome to church. 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 Welcome to Well, good morning and welcome. It's welcome from me and welcome from him. Hi, Jackson. And of course, welcome to our pastor, Mark. I'm Roger here. I'm one of the elders here. And of course, Mark is our pastor here. You're very welcome to be with us this morning. Love to have you here with us. Let's just commit this service to prayer now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the chance to be here together. Thank you for the chance to meet in your name. And thank you, Lord, that we can do this freely today. Amen. Amen. And yes, Jackson was very keen just to stay in the seat then and wouldn't quite let me come across. But we've just got a few quick notices for you this morning. Um, if you've got children aged up to 11, we have been doing Lighthouse Online on our YouTube channel for oh, something like over 40 episodes. You'll have noticed the last couple of weeks there haven't been episodes. That's because we're emailing out things to families. If you want to receive those emails, just send us, um, send us your email address and your details and we'll send out those resources to you. And we're going to be relaunching Lighthouse Online in February. Um, also, there's a few notices this morning. We've got a newcomer Zoom. You might have noticed it from the notice slides on the 24th of January. That's going to be after the service. So if you've, it's called Newcomer Zoom. You might have been coming since last March, but never actually seen anyone face to face. And you might want to just have a chat. So we'd love it if you connect in. Um, you might have never been to church really before, or you might have been coming for years, and this might just be the next stage in your journey. Um, please connect in with that, and um, details will be sent out in due course and on our Facebook page. So look out for those. And, um, and also, uh, we're starting an exploring baptism course very soon. It's going to be four sessions of about an hour each, and that's going to be um, held fortnightly on Zoom. So if you, are, um, if you want to be baptized or you're just interested in what it's all about, uh, please let, come along to that course um, that we're going to be running. And uh, one last notice, um, we've got our Forward in Prayer. This is our Churches Together in Ashford uh, prayer event that's happening on Zoom on the 24th as well, next Sunday, 7 p.m. in the evening. The link is out there. It's going to be on our Facebook page. You might have seen it on the notice slides as well. Um, so please do connect in with all of our churches across our town as we pray um, about moving forward together uh, into 2021. Right. How do we get in touch, Rog? People ah. to get in touch. Oh, well, the, just above Mark's head there, there you've got the text number there nice and clearly. I can't see it and I haven't got wrong glasses to do that. But fortunately, I don't need to write it down. It's just above. And it'll be there all through the service. So please do send through any comments you get, a picture of words or anything there. And then we can pick them up later. Or if it's something else that needs to be picked up during the week, then Mark and uh, the team here can do that. Yeah, definitely. And, um, and some people have already put in the YouTube uh, comments, things there. Thankful for this morning, the sunshine. We'd love to know. We're going to be singing about being thankful to God this morning. So things that you're thankful for, uh, maybe just message in. It might just be one word or a phrase or something um, that just says something that you're thankful for today. Uh, now, Rog, um, there was a number of us who went to uh, a conference, Fresh Streams. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Fresh Streams is a, a network of churches in our Baptist family uh, committed to word and spirit and, you know, the, um, something that we're a part of. Um, so a number of the team went along. You were one of them um, this last week. Just tell us a bit about that and the highlights. We did. It's always interesting when we say coming along when we actually, actually we zoomed in and sort of sat there in your living room or whatever to have it. But it was tremendous. Um, and they got more people to go than any other year so far with being online, and that was great. But a couple of things really came to me. Uh, and one of them really was on discipleship and how important that is and how that spreading the word of God is spreading throughout the world through the discipleship classes. And it's something that's very special and we'll no doubt be coming back to it even more in time. But let's get the discipleships growing and up and running because that's where growth is really coming for at the moment. We need to back that up. Yeah. Then the other thing was many people obviously at the moment are struggling and uh, there's a real sense of well-being renewal that we're looking at as well. Um, 
and to look at that and it would be great if we can provide a space where it's okay not to be okay. Yeah, yeah, great. so important, such important things right now, discipleship, mental well-being. Um, yeah, maybe just as we come to worship this morning, Roger, would you, would you just pray for us? Yeah. It'd be great. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're here now, Lord, and for all the preparation that's gone on to now, we thank you, Lord, for the IT that's made this possible, just as it was possible for that fresh dreams, Lord Jesus. And we just thank you that you're here with us whenever two or more gather together, and there's many more that gather together thanks to the internet. We thank you, Lord, for this set chance to be together today. And we remember our brothers and sisters who can't be with us, uh, but can be that through the medium of Zoom and everything. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Good morning. As Mark said, we're going to, uh, to focus on a few songs for um, um, just thanking God for who he is. And, you know, I'm really thankful that God isn't a God that goes into lockdown. You know, I, I'm so thankful that our God doesn't just take a break because he can't leave his house. You know, we, we have an exciting God. We have an exciting father that we follow. That part of his family. You know, in Psalms, David says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from, from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No, no shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed. And yeah, I know, we, as Roger's already ex expressed, there are a number of us who are feeling really just quite down and, and, and frustrated and, and, and just want this whole thing to be over. But it says here, in my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Let's sing. Let's sing about that. Let's praise our God this morning. He is a great God. A great God that even when we're feeling weary, when we're feeling down, when we're feeling just out of sorts, he doesn't change. That's just incredible. I just encourage you, wherever you are in your homes, just to take these songs, sing them, stand, praise, dance, or if you don't feel like singing, just use the words as, as prayer. But just, just take this time just to reflect on how God just doesn't fail. How is the, he is the faithful one. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. Love endures forever, for he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever, sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever.
by the grace of God we will carry on His love and just forever sing praise sing acceptance that as churches will not go back to how it was before the normal that we got to know but what was equally clear is that God is doing a new thing we need to be open to this and the leading of the Holy Spirit let us pray Lord open our hearts and minds to the new Help us, Lord, to be responsive, ready, willing, and obedient. To lean into all the more into the guidance of the Holy Spirit. 
And Father, we pray for the end of this pandemic. Oh Lord, do we pray that. And Father, we pray for all those working in the caring professions, putting themselves first to help and save us. Father, we pray for all those in the emergency services. And Father, we also pray for those working in education. And in turn, we pray for all who are struggling with loneliness, depression, financial worries, and safety of their loved ones. Lord, guide us as a church to, say, to create a safe place, a safe place where it's okay not to be okay, and the love of Jesus Christ will shine through. And as the pandemic rolls on, and even when millions of vaccinations have been achieved, which we trust will bring it under management control, the fallout from the unemployment, the PTSD, for many of the medical workers is going to be extreme. Lord, guide us into planning how we can play our part in this community. Guide us to be ready. And then also at the Fresh Streams, not to be forgotten. At the online conference, we got brought up today on the work of Open Doors, that Christian organisation that looks out for those being persecuted. And very recently, on January the 13th of this year, they published their latest World Watch List. And this list is an annual rating of the countries where Jesus and the Christians face the most persecution. Over 340 million Christians are persecuted this year. And they follow Jesus no matter what the cost. So Lord, whilst it's right for us to pray for our brothers and sisters and the pandemic, let us not forget our persecuted brothers and sisters who not only face the prosecution, but the pandemic as well. We give thanks to the work of the Open Doors in supporting these Christian brothers and sisters. And above all, please remember them in your own prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, your kingdom come, your will be done. Amen. thank you that you are above everything father we just thank you that your your strength your love your kindness your something that we can rely on father at this time i just pray for every one of my church family that they will know in this situation that whatever they fear you're there Father sometimes we just need to put our hand up and grab hold of yours sometimes Lord we're just on our knees and we just want to we just need to say Father just carry us but you are there tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I hold when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken 
I'll raise a hallelujah 
sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is got a few um, messages coming in of thanks to the Lord. It says, thank you, Lord, for your endless love for us. Praise your holy name. We lift our hearts and voices to you this day. Your mercies are new every morning. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, thank you for my brothers and sisters that pray for me. And thank you that I can pray for them. Yeah, thank you, Lord, that we can lift each other up at this time. It says, because you are close to me and always available, my confidence will never be shaken, for I experience your wraparound presence every every moment. Psalm 16, verse 8 from Linda. Thank you, Linda, for sending that verse of encouragement in. And it says, how great is our God, how great is his name, how great is his love for each one of us, always and forever. Amen. Yeah, we thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, and we just pray, God, as we come to just read your word today, Lord, as we come to look at Acts, inspire us, Lord God. Um, strengthen us, comfort us, encourage us, uh, and breathe your, your life and your renewing power into your church this morning. God, we're aware your spirit is with us, and Holy Spirit, illuminate your word, Lord. Illuminate that word so that it catches fire in our hearts and burns with a passion for Jesus and his gospel and his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Well, someone also messaged in saying, poor Jackson, someone took his sofa away. And don't worry, that's why I thought we'll leave Jackson. He's comfortable in the seat. Um, You know, I I was rudely um, pushed him off earlier. But the sofa will be back in in future weeks. So do not worry. Um, He's okay. I think he's pretty comfortable where he is. But we're going to look at Acts um, Acts 10 this morning. Acts chapter 10. We're continuing our exploration of Acts. You know, we're going to be looking actually at the first 13 um, chapters of this, right at the kind of cusp of Paul launching out on his first um, mission journey. So we're into the, um, the latter part of our um, exploration of Acts. And we've called this series Advance. And really our heart was to look at the extraordinary explosive advance of this movement called the church. Um, This move of the Spirit of God, that is what the church is. Uh, And right at the beginning, um, we want to see from the very start lessons that we can learn as the church today. And, you know, as we said, the church is a move of God. You know, it's no less than a move of God. It is a spirit-filled movement from start to finish. And so we looked at the ascension of Jesus in Acts 1 and and then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that followed in Acts 2 and the signs and wonders that were being performed amongst the community of believers in the following chapters and this wonderful community they shared together. We looked at the way that God used new leaders who, who were raised up to share the gospel powerfully with, again, with signs and wonders accompanying and fulfilling a kind of an apostolic ministry. And then we saw the opposition that started to come. You know, serious opposition to this new move of God. You know, there was a threat of corruption. There was the, um, with Ananias and Sapphira, there was the, um, the, the persecution that came with the stoning of Stephen. And, um, and we saw actually, though, how through that tragedy, you know, Stephen's martyrdom, how the glory of God shone forth and also how the gospel then went forth into Samaria. And, you know, we saw Philip, sharing the gospel, and then this Ethiopian eunuch who, is, who comes to faith in God. And then we saw Saul's conversion last week in chapter 9. You know, this persecutor turned church planter. And what we're seeing is we're seeing things accelerate. 
We've seen a church that started with 120 and then grew to 3,000 and then grew to 5,000. And um, you know, by this point, I think they've lost counts. And, and in Acts 1 verse 8, it's not just about numerical growth. It's about the advance of the kingdom. So right at the beginning, Jesus says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And you know, I don't think when Jesus said that, the apostles knew how on earth that was going to take place. And yet we've seen, haven't we, you know, the gospel bearing fruit in Jerusalem in, in chapters kind of two to seven. And then we see the gospel break out into Samaria in Acts eight. And then it's in Damascus in Syria by the time we reach Acts nine. And, you know, it's worth noting that so far as we've looked through Acts, all of these believers in Jesus have come from a Jewish background. Even the Ethiopian eunuch, he has Jewish beliefs. He is a God-fearer. But now the gospel is about to break new ground. And, and God is setting the stage for the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. And he's showing Peter, this, this apostle, the one to whom Jesus says, I give you the keys of the kingdom. And we're going to see how those keys open up um, new avenues for the gospel. How he's showing Peter, actually, this good news is for everyone. It's for everyone, for Jew and Gentile. And I just want to say from the outset, we, we don't appreciate this. This was a massive shift in thinking for, um, for Jewish believers in, the, in their day. You know, their culture and their ancestry told them they were God's chosen people. You know, as descendants of Abraham, they were part of God's family. This is, this is true. Scripture tells us this. And they were called to be a holy people set apart from the other tribes and nations around them. And, and, you know, the law was given to them, you know, through Moses. You know, so this was their identity. And so by, by definition, um, many Jews felt if you were not descended from Abraham, if you did not possess the law of Moses, you were, you were an outsider. You were excluded. You could not be accepted by God. And that was actually never the way it was meant to be. You know, there's a slight kind of distortion there in that way of thinking because Genesis tells us God created all of humanity in his image. And, and, and Genesis also tells us that God says to Abraham, through you, all nations will be blessed and it be through your offspring. And then David, this great king, he speaks in the Psalms of all the nations. You know, sing, sing to the Lord, all you nations. He sees something of, of praise being released across the whole earth. And then Habakkuk speaks, uh, uh, this minor prophet, of the, the earth being filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And so through the Old Testament, we also see there were foreigners, there were people outside of Israel who became part of the covenant people of God at different points. However, in order to do so, and this is important, up till this point, all of these people had to take on the law of Moses. You know, they had to follow the Old Testament law, these, these regulations um, that, that set out how the people of God were to live in this time in order to be distinct from the nations and tribes around them. But Jesus coming into the world changed everything. Uh, it changed everything forever. You know, Jesus came and he established a new covenant, a new um, a new basis on which we can have a relationship with God the Father. And, and this basis is that Jesus himself is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And, you know, therefore, Paul, you know, the man who we heard about last week, who was Saul, who was, um, who was a, a Jewish leader, who was a Pharisee of Pharisees, who was zealous for the law of Moses and the traditions of his fathers um, before he had that encounter on the Damascus Road. Paul himself, um, who if anyone had any reason to boast in the law, it would be Paul. He wrote as much. That he writes in his letter to the Romans in chapter 3, verse 21, he writes this astonishing, astonishing, um, these astonishing verses. He says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. And this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. 
In other words, it's all through Jesus Christ now. It's all about him. It's all about what he has done for us. And so actually, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. There's no, there's no difference. You know, in fact, now it's all about Jesus. You know, he is both the Jewish Messiah and he's the savior of the world. And Paul's telling us, salvation's found in Jesus Christ and no one else. All are welcomed into the Father's arms through Jesus. And that's why Jesus told his followers to make disciples of all nations. He didn't say to them, go and find Jewish people in, in all the surrounding nations and, and, and tell them about me. He says, make disciples of every nation. And he says, you're going to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. And I just want to set this context because actually it still took quite some getting used to for the people at the time. And we have to appreciate that. You know, Israel, if you like, had, had kind of slightly, um, well, really quite, um, quite significantly twisted this doctrine of election of being chosen people into one of favoritism. And we'll see that come up today. And that had caused racial pride and barriers and, and hatred. And, you know, these things rise up in people today, don't they? You know, that we, we can be fearful of someone who's not like us. We can be fearful of people with a different background or culture to ours. And we can even at times have a feeling or a sense of superiority that our way is the right way. And, and so in the day, Orthodox Jews, they would not have associated with Gentiles, with people from other nations. They wouldn't eat with Gentiles. They wouldn't enter into their homes. And there was this huge gulf. And this was wrong. And now in Jesus, suddenly they're told they're to call these Gentiles brother and sister. Just like Ananias uh, called Saul, this man who was coming to kill him and his friends, or at least to throw them in jail. He goes to him and he calls him Brother Saul because God has revealed himself to him. So the gospel is breaking down barriers already and we're about to see it break down yet another one. So let's see how this shift in thinking happened. And we're going to read from Acts 10. And it's a long chapter, but it's kind of all one story. So we're going to split it into three scenes. So here is scene one, if you like. Uh, let's just read it together. If you've got a Bible, you can look at it. It says, At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and he sent them to Joppa. Now, we're learning some background here. Cornelius, this man, is a, a centurion. Um, you know, so he's not only a Gentile, he's also uh, part of the Roman army and so was particularly despised by the Jews. So if they had any reason to hate anybody, it would be someone like Cornelius. But he and his family are described as devout and God-fearing. And this expression, it referred to Gentiles who, who prayed to and worshipped the God of Israel. Now, it's worth saying he hadn't gone the whole way and converted to, to Judaism. You know, he hadn't been circumcised, which was a particular stumbling block to men for understandable reasons. But he would have observed other Jewish customs at the time. And we read that he gave generously to those who were in need. And so we read about three in the afternoon, which is, if you remember from Acts 3, it's the time of prayer. You know, it's one of these Jewish times of prayer in the day. Cornelius has a vision of an angel, you know, presumably as he's praying. You know, God has seen his heart, the angel says. You know, his prayers, his gifts to the poor, they've come up as a memorial offering before God. Strange language to us nowadays, perhaps, but it's, it's Old Testament sacrificial language that Cornelius would have been familiar with. And God's saying, I've received your worship. It's acceptable to me. But let's just be clear at this point. 
it's clear that this is not in and of itself sufficient. Cornelius needs the gospel. And God knows this, of course, and the arrangements are about to be put in place. That's what this encounter, that's what this vision is all about. Um, Cornelius is given instructions to set things in motion. And as a man under authority himself, as a, as a, a leader in the Roman army, um, as one who knows what command is all about, he dutifully obeys. And that's really important. You know, Cornelius' obedience to God here is key. He sends two servants and he sends one of his um, soldiers who's also, it seems, a God-fearer too. He's devout. He sends them to Joppa, which is about 32 miles down the coast, right next to modern-day Tel Aviv, if any of you have been out to Israel. So let's just go to scene two and dive in again. And we're going to read from Acts 10, verse 9. So about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up onto the roof to pray. That's in Joppa. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. And it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never ever eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. And they called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one who you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we've come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that you could hear what, he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into his house to be his guests. This is a slightly more extraordinary vision that Peter has, I think. And, you know, again, it's noon. So once more, it's one of these times, these Jewish times of prayer, and Peter goes up onto the roof. Can I just say, as I've read these chapters of Acts again and again, um, it has struck me, if you ever have wondered whether spiritual disciplines and quiet times with God are important, maybe you just think, oh, that's just a bit religious. Well, actually, we see here, the early church, they practiced these times of prayer. They set aside time to be with the Lord. And that seems to be where the most extraordinary visions, words from God, miracles seem to come. So, you know, if you want God to speak to you, carve out some regular time to listen to him in prayer. And don't be surprised when he does speak to you. You know, I was um, speaking to Izzy about this and she said, you know, it's not a chore to do this. It's a joy. Because you experience God more and you see him move. Now, Peter has this very strange vision when he does this, when he sets aside this time to pray. And if you wanted to be cynical, which hopefully you're not, you might just put this down to the fact that he's hungry. But obviously God's word tells us this isn't the case. You know, in the Jewish law, to give a bit more background, there were many animals um, which Jewish people were not allowed to eat because they were unclean. And that included any meat for example, from a pig. And Peter sees all of these animals, presumably of which many were unclean according to Jewish food laws, being lowered on a sheet from heaven as if somehow a gift from God. And then this voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And when he protests, as you would expect he would with his culture and his upbringing and his knowledge of the law and says, you know, how, I, I can't eat anything that is unclean. He's told by God not to call anything impure that God has made clean. And in case he thought that his mind was just playing tricks on him, he's given this same vision three times. And there is more, it should be said, to this vision than it's not just about animals and food. It's not just about Peter being hungry at this moment. 
This is about God opening Peter's heart in order to reach the Gentiles. That's what's going on here. You know, specifically in this instance, it's going to be Cornelius and his friends and his family with the gospel. And so he says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And it's like it's been coaxed out of us. If God is saying this about animals, how much more so will he say this about people who are made in his image, whom Jesus has died for? You know, that's the message for Peter. And that's the message sometimes for us as well in our own prejudices and where our own barriers You know, don't call anything impure. God has made clean. If Jesus has died for these people, you are to reach them with the gospel. But then we have one of these wonderful incidences of God's timing. I don't know if you've experienced this in your life before. Just miraculous, amazing, um, appointed, you know, divine appointments we sometimes call them. Because no sooner has he had this vision that the men turn up. And the Spirit tells Peter that these men are actually there and looking for him before they've even rung the doorbell. And you can see that God is, is seeking to make it really clear to Peter that he has sent these Gentiles to him. This is of God. And so when, when Peter's spoken to them, it says in verse 23, he invites them in to be his guests. And if you remember what we said earlier, this is probably something Peter would never have done. Even just a few hours earlier but now he sees God's doing a new thing I'm to let these people into my home I'm not to call anything impure that God has made clean so these men are going to be my guests and some say the most significant conversion to take place in this passage in Acts 10 is not Cornelius's conversion but it's Peter's Peter is converted to realizing that Jesus is the savior of Jew and Gentile and there really is no difference and so we come to scene three This final part in Acts 10, and we're going to read from the second part of verse 23. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along as well. And the following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and he found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone unpure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He's a guest at the home of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Now, that's what you call a a captive audience who are ready to hear the gospel. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning of Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who'd come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. 
Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered they be baptized in the name of, the G- of Jesus Christ. And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Now, there's something very important to notice about Cornelius for us as disciples of Jesus, I think. Just before we go into a bit more detail about this message Peter preached. You know, Cornelius is what we might call a key person or, or a person of peace. If you're not familiar with this terminology, when Jesus sent out the 72, he told them to look for people of peace when they came to a new village. And these were people who would offer them hospitality, people who they could stay with, who, who essentially opened the door to them and to the message that they came to share. And Cornelius is the most amazing example of this. He is open to the gospel, as we already know. He opens his home as a place for the gospel to be preached. And not only that, he gathers a whole crowd of relatives and close friends. You know, as we said, he said, we're in the presence of God. We're ready to hear what you have to say. This is an extraordinary open door for the gospel. And today there are people like this too. People who who seek God and as they do so, they bring a crowd with them. People who before they even come to faith are are starting to evangelize their friends and families and share what they are learning and bringing them along to hear the gospel too on the journey with them. And you might have come across these people before. In fact, actually, you probably have done whether you know it or not. These people are around about us. And as we seek to share the gospel, we want God to lead us particularly to these people of peace in our community. People like Cornelius, you know, this is how the gospel advances. This is a key way. Uh, As we look to break new ground for the gospel and reach new communities, maybe to reach whole groups of people or estates for the Lord, we need to ask God to show us who these key people are. In verse 34, Peter starts then to preach the gospel and he, he starts with a personal revelation that he has received, which also in turn touches the hearts of those listening. You know, these people, some of them may have felt distant to the faith, distant from God. Uh, they might have felt like they're on the outside looking in. And there's so many people in the world today who feel in that position. But Peter says, I now realize how true it is. God does not show favoritism. He accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know, of course, as we said earlier, this in itself is not enough. It's not enough to just to just um, to just do what is right. It's not enough even simply just to fear God. But we need Jesus, Uh, and that's why, as we said, God has sent Peter. That's why this whole extraordinary uh, sequence of events occurs. But. Nevertheless, this is an extraordinary message in the first century and it's one that we need to take heart today, as we've said. You know, we looked at it last week with Paul, didn't we? And we said there's no one, no one who's beyond the grace of God. There is no group of people who are overlooked or forgotten by God. We might know this as head knowledge. We need it to become heart knowledge. You know, in fact, we worship a God actually who cares deeply about the marginalized and those cast aside by the world. And again, we need this to hit our hearts and we need to start caring deeply about the people who God cares for. And that means where we have prejudices, whatever they may be, and we probably all have them as human beings. In fact, we definitely do. We need to allow God's love to overcome them. Peter preaches this good news of Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. He shares this good news of Jesus' life, his death and his resurrection. He says how they were witnesses to this truth. And, And finally, he says in verse 43, he says how the prophets testify that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone. And this was a wonderful message to those listening to him. And this is a glorious message for the world today. And then we have this wonderful event, just as we come to the end. And this is like the Gentile version of Pentecost, right? Because the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them as the gospel is preached. You know, this is what I pray for whenever I share God's word, that the Holy Spirit would just move in people's lives and their hearts. 
You know, because these people, they start speaking in tongues and praising God. I think they were starting to do this even before Peter had finished what he was saying. They were so hungry for God. They were so hungry for his word. They were so hungry for his presence. And it's like they've been saved and delivered and set free as Peter has been preaching these words. You know, it is clear and it is undeniable to these circumcised believers present. Maybe some of the believers who we read came up with Peter from Joppa. Maybe they were skeptical. Maybe they were wondering, is this really the direction we want to be going in, Peter? Have you really heard from God on this one? But now they can see undeniably God is working in these people's lives and there's no turning back. You know, there is no mistake in what this means. If the Holy Spirit has filled these new converts, uh, then they have been washed clean. They are holy, not by circumcision, not by the law, not by any traditions, not even by the good things they have done, noble as they are, but by Jesus himself through his death and resurrection. And so Peter says there's nothing standing in their way of being baptized with water too, which is the sign of initiation and inclusion in the body of Christ. You know, um, it's worth us just saying we're running this course on exploring baptism for those who are interested in taking this step. And maybe you've experienced God's presence and his power. You know, if you have experienced the power of his Holy Spirit uh, uh, touching your life, uh, maybe you've experienced it today, God's calling you. He's saying, you know, go all in, be baptized, profess your faith. You know, there's no turning back. And, you know, if you want to do that, do get in touch. But Acts 10 is groundbreaking. And, you know, it's significant for us because we live in the light of this gospel breakthrough. We live in the light of Acts 10, the ground that was broken all of those years ago. But the question for us is, where are we going to break new ground for the gospel? Which divides are we going to bridge? What groups of people might we share with? Where is God leading us in, in our prayer times? Are we having those prayer times? Yeah, who are the key people? Who are these Cornelius types that God has already put you in contact with who are going to open doors for the gospel? And I think just as we come to pray, maybe some of us need a reconversion like Peter. Maybe it's a, a conversion of our heart to really see the deep need that others have of Jesus in their lives around us. You know, maybe you just forget about the fact that people need Jesus above everything else. Maybe we need a conversion of our heart to reach out to people who we share very little in common with. Or maybe we need a conversion to break down our own prejudices and realize that God shows no favoritism. Maybe it's simply just a conversion of our hearts to actually begin to share this wonderful news with others. Maybe this is something we've never got to, but actually this is central to being obedient to Jesus and obedient to the Holy Spirit. You know, when the Holy Spirit fills us, you can be sure that he's going to be calling us to share the gospel with other people. And so we need to be obedient to him. We need to be filled with his power, his presence. So I just want, as we come to worship God, I want to just to invite the Holy Spirit to come and to move among us now and, and to bless what he's already doing. Maybe he's already stirring in your heart this morning. Just remember, the church is a move of God from start to finish and we need to be filled with his presence and power. And we see that again and again in Acts. You know, and you know, if you're not sure you've been filled with the Spirit before, maybe just put your hands out in front of you now and ask that he would fall upon you and surrender to him. So Holy Spirit, we just ask, uh, come and fill us now. God, we are, we are desperate for you. We yearn for you. Lord, we long for you to come and just blow away the things in our lives that are just uh, weighing us down. Lord, uh, we know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And God, we long to experience this freedom in even greater measure. And God, we want our lips to be set free to, to praise you like these believers um, in, 
in Acts 10. We want our mouths to be released to proclaim your gospel. And right now, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just bring that release and that freedom now for my brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray right now, God, that you would be setting uh, mouths and tongues on fire to speak your word. Um, Lord, I pray that right now, God, you would be pouring out um, your spirit like a healing balm upon people who are fearful and troubled. And God, I pray right now you'd be delivering and setting people free from anxiety and fear in the name of Jesus. And God, we pray you would empower your church to proclaim your word. Lord, we pray that you would empower new believers in Jesus Christ who've heard your gospel for the first time to know you and to follow you all the days of your life. And Lord, we just surrender our lives to you now and ask Holy Spirit, have your way in us. And you know, the Zoom prayer room is going to be open at the end of the service and um, people will stand with you in prayer. But even now, as we worship God, just use these songs as a prayer to cry out to him, you know, continue to receive from him, uh, continue to ask him personally to move in your heart and your life this morning. I'm laying down everything that I have. I would live for Jesus. I want to do everything to His glory. Although it's a challenging thing to say, I would encourage us all to use these words as a prayer. Maybe just as a start, a fresh start, as Mark says. I'm laying down my life. in my 
to bow down, for every heart to believe, for every voice to cry out, burn like a fire in me, for every tongue to confess, for you alone are the King, you are the hope of the earth. hunger and thirst for you Uh, and Lord we desire to burn like a fire for the sake of this world Lord to be the light of the world um, to bring your light to shine in the darkness and your gospel of hope to the hopeless your peace to the anxious uh, Lord your love um, to the lost and Father um, we just pray that you would anoint us now, Lord God, just as we rest here, as we, as we stretch our arms out wide, or we sit in your presence, or we stand before you, God, let your spirit um, just fan into flame that, you know, any, any embers that seem to be dying away and fan them into a roaring fire for you, a passion for you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, fall afresh on us now. Just a reminder, Zoom prayer room is is open. Um, So it's open now for those who just want to stand in prayer. We encourage you, you know, you might just want to continue um, in prayer right now. And if that's you, just don't worry about what we're saying now. You just spend time with the Lord. Keep on receiving from Him. Keep on praying before Him and seeking after Him. Uh, And um, yeah, but people will stand with you in prayer as well if you would like that. Yeah. yeah, if you're not sure to go, Paul has always said you can't have enough prayer. So if you're not sure, you're worried about that barrier, it is all in confidence uh, and they're just sitting waiting there to pray with you. So take that opportunity now. Yeah. Uh, remember, you can still get in contact with us. Uh, the number above Mark's head is still there. I'm glad to say people have already come through already today. So that's been great. And the information you want uh, is on our Facebook page and emails that have been sent out. Obviously, the weekly update in terms of that. And uh, I'll also add the well-being link that was from the Fresh um, this week. Uh, and there's some interesting information there as well. Yeah, yeah. So do, do connect in. Do stay connected um, in all the various ways that we can do at this time. Um, but uh, until, we, until we see you next time, uh, we pray God to bless you. We just pray God to continue stirring in your heart and the power of his spirit um, to go and to reach those that you love, those around you, those people who he's going to be laying on your heart this week and those wonderful encounters and divine appointments that you might have. Mm. Just pray that you will um, be able to 
share Jesus with those people and see God working in amazing and surprising and wonderful ways. See you again very soon. Welcome to church. 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 Hi, welcome.